Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, continue to have your lunch, and uh, welcome to this healthcare forum today. Uh, my name is Jeff Warndoff, Director of IT for University of Kansas Physicians. I appreciate everybody's presence today. Uh, today's healthcare forum is going to discuss a computer system designed, developed, and implemented by IBM. The system is called Watson. And as I presented the flyer, a lot of people had the question, what is Watson? Very good question to ask. I think during this uh, health forum, we're going to answer that question, what is Watson? But also, we're going to look at the question, what is the potential of Watson within healthcare? The audience today, you can see, is a collaboration of, of many groups. Um, we have employees here from the University of Kansas Physicians, University of Kansas Hospital, Kansas University Medical Center. You know, in collaboration of clinical care, academic research, and administration, we're going to look at the future of technology and review one of those opportunities, and this is one forum that we can review that. At this time, I'd like to introduce a, a good friend of mine and a senior executive from IBM, Scott Ferber. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. I think I'm supposed to take your mic. Yes, you are. Okay. Well, listen, good afternoon, and um, thanks for being here. Again, my name's Scott Ferber. I'm the senior executive for IBM here in Kansas City. And I, I know this was relatively short notice to bring you together. I especially appreciate Jeff's help in, in doing this. It's, a, I think, a pretty unique opportunity we have here today and, um, to talk about a subject I think you'll find very insightful and thoughtful, and, and you'll give us some good feedback and input on. So as you may know, um, IBM built a computer to play Jeopardy, and we named the computer Watson after our founder. And actually the match, the, the Jeopardy match happened back in February, where this computer played the two uh, most distinguished um, Jeopardy champions. Um, and it was really an interesting, uh, and, and David Ferrucci will talk about it, um, how it played out. You know, I wanted to share with you that when I first heard about IBM doing this, and I've worked for IBM you know, for 26 years, I honestly really didn't get it. I mean, I knew we were building this computer, but I, I never watched Jeopardy, so I really didn't understand why this was such a big challenge for us. Uh, and and I, so I didn't understand, well, how does a computer that play Jeopardy help our clients? How can it help you solve the issues that you have or tackle the opportunities that you might have? And then I watched the show. Um, the first couple days I watched with IBM colleagues, and then the last day we, you know, we had a group of clients that watched us with, with us, and uh, the light bulb went off for me. Because you know, in the show, you can see how Watson understood natural language, how we communicate, with all the kind of imperfections and nuances in, in how we communicate. For the first time, a computer understood it. And, then could search literally hundreds of millions of pages of information and return a very specific answer in a couple seconds, a along with the probability or a probability that it was correct. And so I could then see, well, how this, how this is unique, how this was a breakthrough, how this could help our clients in many industries, including healthcare and medicine, which we'll obviously talk about today, uh, but other industries, government, law, finance, publishing, um, pretty exciting. So again, we're fortunate to have Dr. David Ferrucci with us today. David is IBM's um, chief scientist that really led the team that built this over the last four or five years. Um, David is an IBM fellow uh, and our principal investigator on this research project. Uh, he went to you know, uh, Manhattan College and has a BS in biology and then went to RPI and has a PhD in computer science. I joined IBM in 1995. Um, as we talked about on the way over, David's world has been a little upside down here since the Watson um, uh, show aired as he's been traveling nonstop and giving talks and with clients about you know, what this is, why it's uh, important, why it's a breakthrough. So um, looking forward to this discussion. We'll have a, a presentation by David and, um, and then we'll open it up and hope you know, would like a lot of dialogue and questions and, you know, from you that we can answer and talk more about this, and some ideas, some suggestions, some insight that you can give us. So please help me welcome uh, Dr. David Ferrucci. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you. Um, this is my first time in Kansas City, and if I can, you know, talk about my first impression based on the turkey sandwich, this is a great place because that's the kind of turkey, you know, I get at Thanksgiving. I mean, that's the real turkey. It's actually very, very good. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, about Watson and about the Jeopardy Challenge and ultimately how that relates to um, how this kind of technology can have some impact uh, in, in healthcare. So I'm going to kind of tell this, I'm going to build the story up to healthcare. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about um, what the Jeopardy Challenge was like. And then one of the focal points of that discussion is going to be about how Watson collects and scores evidence. Uh, evidence from natural language content, and then we'll tie that into how uh, how we uh, how I think that can help in both diagnostics as well as in treatments. So the first thing, you know, if we think about the kind of challenge we took on with with the Watson with Jeopardy, and you compare it to the sort of prior challenge that IBM took on, which was in uh, of this nature, which was in chess, is very two very different kinds of problems, right? In, in chess, you have this finite, mathematically well-defined search space, and you have these limited number of moves and limited number of, uh, of pieces that can take on these very, very precise sorts of movements. And you can, you can start to predict by doing look ahead. You know, you can, you can look at all the various kinds of moves that can be made, and then with some really smart evaluation, board evaluation functions, and from at the time, certainly in the mid-90s, you need some powerful compute power, parallel compute power, you can start looking at enormous number of possibilities and, and look far enough ahead with those kinds of algorithms and that kind of compute power that you could start you know, uh, playing against and beating grand champions. And now, of course, it's uh, nearly impossible to compete a, com beat a computer at chess. <clears throat> Natural language is very different, though, because you don't have that mathematically well-defined problem. You have words and phrases. You have the human language. And human language is created by humans to communicate with other humans. It's not a formal language. There's no, formal, uh, there's no simple formula to describe its meaning or how to interpret it. It's something that is really used in context uh, and how humans dialogue and communicate with each other about all kinds of topics. And that context, the information, the, the human experience that surrounds a word or surrounds a phrase or a sentence is really what gives it its meaning. Uh, I, I have a great example for you. And I have two young daughters, a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old. And one, a common experience in the Frucci household is for me yelling down to everybody, going, come down here, you have to see this. This is really interesting. And usually I'm doing some sort of scientific experiment in the kitchen sink or in the backyard. Come on down here. This is really interesting. And um, you know, so my daughters would come down. And my older daughter is kind of finding this you know, fascinating. My younger daughter is kind of questioning whether or not this is, uh, uh, this is fun for her. And then one time I yelled down to them. I said, come down here. This is really interesting. And, and my, uh, my older one, my nine-year-old, came running down. And my seven-year-old stood at the top of the step saying, you know, Daddy, I think interesting things are boring. And she wasn't making a joke. I mean, she was assigning, you know, she, she heard the word boring. She knew what boring meant to her. The word interesting was used by me predominantly, you know, in, in, in the household. So what interesting meant to her was boring. And that's what it meant. I said, no, you know, you find different things interesting. She goes, no, interesting is boring. So, you know, it's, it's that context through which words are used that it re really you, you acquire their meaning. And, and I can imagine, for example, what uh, physicians face all the time is understanding symptoms reported by people and what the words they use really mean and how it relates to the actual findings. Right? This is always, of course, a challenge. And unless you understand a lot about uh, you've seen enough patients and you have statistics on how these words tend to be used and how they tend to relate to reality, it becomes, of course, a challenge. But when people think about this problem, they wonder, uh, um, you know, as mentioned earlier, you know, what's really hard and what's really easy for a computer? And one of the challenges of communicating about this project to the general audience was kind of getting them to, to think a little bit about what, what's hard and what's easy for a computer. So here are some questions that are easy for a computer, and I'm wondering how well you do at them. The natural log of 12,546,798 times pi squared divided by 34,567.46. Anybody? Look at 50-50 chance, greater than or less than 1. If you're really smart, you can probably do that. Greater than or less than 1. Anybody? So it's less than 1. It's 0 0.00885. So computers are really, really fast at this. This is, this is what they're good at. There's another thing they're good at. You know, select a payment where the owner is David Jones and the type of product equals a laptop. Structured query is a pseudo-structured query language um, against you know, database tables. And what computers are really good is if you populate these data tables, um, you can do these structured queries against them. 
and you can navigate these tables very quickly, and you could find the David Jones, which links to the serial number, navigates to another table, which gets you to the invoice, which gets you to the invoice table, which gets you to the payment. We do this over billions of rows very, very rapidly, and this is what drives so many uh, computer applications, whether it be in, in retail or in healthcare or in finance or all over. I mean, this is a big driving uh, uh, foundation for our technology. And we decide that David Jones is David Jones because in the computer, the computer doesn't really know who David Jones is, but it knows that it has a representation and there's numbers associated with each character and it does all these comparisons, the D is the D and so forth and so on. And you know David Jones is David Jones. And of course you can confuse the computer really easily by having, comparing Dave Jones to David Jones and you may mean it's the same person, but in fact the computer can't even tell because it's no longer equal set of characters. So what do we do in databases? We put in social security numbers or ID numbers and to make sure that we have unique identifiers so we don't confuse the computer because all of a sudden this becomes a harder problem. Well, in fact, dealing with not, not you know, any time you get away from unique identifiers and you start dealing with symbols out of context, the computer has a much harder time. So imagine we had to answer questions like, where was X born? But, uh, and someone told us, let's take the easy case with what we call structured information, so a, a relational table. And someone came along and told you, you're going to get, the computer's going to get this question, so program it that when it gets a question like this, it takes whatever is bound to X, like the person's name, looks it up in the first column, and the answer is what's in the second column. So where was Albert Einstein born? We look it up, Ohm. But imagine that we weren't told that, and we were just given this question, natural language question, nobody told the computer exactly how to interpret it or what it meant, and the computer had a, computer had a bunch of things to read, and it came across this sentence, one day from among his city views of Ulm, Otto chose a watercolor to send to Albert Einstein as remembrance of Einstein's birthplace. So the answer is there, but now the computer is challenged in a very different way. Of all the things it's read, it's focusing on this, maybe because Albert Einstein is mentioned, but who else is involved? Who are the people? Who are the places? What are the relationships? Why does a birthplace have anything to do with being born? You have so much background knowledge to help you, to help you interpret this to get with some confidence that maybe Ulm was where Einstein was born. So you can think of, well, I could write all the heuristics necessary to answer this one problem, but, but the next question is going to be something completely different, like X ran this. So, well, so how do I answer this question? Well, again, if I was told that I answered it by looking things up in this database, I could look up Jack Welch and get, J, and get GE. But on the other hand, if I didn't know exactly what it meant, and I was just reading a bunch of content, and I ran into a sentence, if leadership is an art, then surely Jack Welch has proved himself a master painter during his tenure at GE. With some degree of confidence, I may induce that, or I may deduce in this case, that um, Jack Welch is, was a painter at GE, which is, of course, not true. He's the CEO. So with what kind of confidence can I answer questions depending on natural language, it becomes a much more, uh, much more difficult task. So the Jeopardy challenge comes along, and it's compelling uh, from a, a number of different ways. right? It's going to drive this technology of open domain question answering. What I mean is open domain. I, I'm not telling you ahead of time that you're only going to get to ask these kinds of questions, and that you can look them up in this, in this database. In fact, you know, I can get a huge variety of, of, of question types across a huge variety of content. So broad open domain. If you're standing, it's a direction you should, you should look to check out the wainscoting. Anybody? Wainscoting down. Right, exactly. Somebody had it there. So you know, one of the interesting things is when you look at that question, you say, well, gee, how do I start tackling this problem? I have to model everything that's a direction. How would you model directions? North, east, south, west, all the degrees around a compass. Well, you know, there's another Jeopardy question that asks for the direction of fabric. And the answer is grain. Would you have thought to put grain inside that taxonomy? So the, the bottom line is that you know, language is, is very, very plastic, very flexible. It depends largely on the context and how you understand the content. In cell division, mitosis splits the nucleus, and cytokinesis splits this liquid cushioning the nucleus. Cytoplasm is the answer. Um, and so we go from interior design to cell biology. The first person mentioned by name in the, in the Man in the Iron Mask is this hero of the previous book of the same author. A complex question there, and the answer is D'Artagnan. Uh, again, classic literature. Of the four countries in the world the US, that the U.S. does not have diplomatic relations with, the one that's furthest north. The answer is North Korea there. So we went from, um, from material design to, uh, to cellular biology to classic literature uh, to um, geopolitics. So broad open domain, complex language. You have to be very, very precise to win at the game. And I'm going I'm to tell you how precise in a minute, meaning you have to get the um, vast majority of the questions right if you're going to bother the buzz in. You have to have an accurate confidence. And this was a, one of the key drivers for us from a technology perspective. Is it's not enough to throw up an answer. 
right? So you have to remember now, there's no database where these questions exist and I can just look them up. There's a bunch of content that the computer reads and tries to understand. It gets that question and it tries to come up with an answer, but how does it know it's right? So it, you know, one of the unique things about Jeopardy is if you buzz in to, get, to try to answer that question, you get it wrong, you lose the dollar value associated with that question. So you're taking a risk every time you go to answer. So the computer has to come up with a probability that that, that answer is correct. And how's it going to do that? It has to weigh the evidence that it can collect in support of the various answers and has to score that evidence. And ultimately, that evidence has to be an accurate probability. Otherwise, you can't get in and play the game. You can't choose which questions you want to answer, and you can't make, you can't make bets. And what, what you'll see here is this is ultimately all about how to collect and score uh, evidence across both structured the, uh, um, content as well as unstructured or natural language content. You have to do it very, very quickly in about three seconds to be competitive. We actually looked at about 25, uh, about 20,000 Jeopardy questions, and we tried to understand how broad the domain really is. And about 13% didn't refer to anything. They were just like this or it. They referred to no class. But the other 87% uh, referred to all kinds of things, from flu uh, fruits to colors to places to, um, to fathers to novelists to vegetables to diseases to insects to substances, huge, huge variety. And we have this very really long tail phenomenon, which means that even if you attack the head of the tail here and try to, try to anticipate all possible questions about all things mentioned here, you only cover less than 10% of the data. But of course, you couldn't even anticipate all, all possible questions that can be asked about those topics. But even if you did, where would you concentrate? So the point of the slide is, ultimately, what we needed to do was just to acquire as much information as we could, reference, uh, reference books, encyclopedias, dictionaries, thesauri, uh, entire plays, novels and have the computer try to read them. I put read in quotes because the computer doesn't understand things as well as people do, uh, do not even close. But it has to try to analyze them well enough to be able to accurately and confidently answer these natural language questions. So what kinds of things would we have to do? So we take large bodies of content and we have programs that parse it. So do sort of you're in high school, you would sort of break the grammar down to the subject. Um, the verb, the object, the prepositional phrase, the object of the preposition, you look at the modifiers and what, what part of the sentence modifies what other, par other parts of the sentence. And then from, from this, so for the computer doing this automatically, you would then try to do uh, semantic analysis of that and then, and then um, compute statistics over all that content. So we can say, you know what, the computer can infer, you know what, inventors patent inventions, officials submit resignations, people earn degrees at school, fluid is a liquid, liquid is a fluid, vessels sink. People sink eight balls in the game of pool. All right, I put that last one in there because context is very important. You know, what kinds of things typically sink? Well, it sort of depends on the context. And so we have to capture from the text a representation of the context in which these, which these, um, these inferences are more likely true. And of course, everything ultimately is probabilistic based on the statistics we report. So is fluid a liquid or is liquid a fluid? Anybody know? Fluid is the more general thing, right? So a liquid is a type of fluid, but a fluid is not actually a type of liquid, liquid if you went and looked at a database of strict taxonomy. So take that question again. In cell division, mitosis splits the nucleus, and cytokinesis splits this liquid cushioning the nucleus. One of the things that Watson does to answer this question is it's not an expert in this area. It's going to go out and try to understand the question and then look at what it's read. And it generates many possible alternatives. So things like organelle, vacuole, cytoplasm, plasma, mitochondria, blood, and so forth. And what it has to do now is build some evidence that one of these answers is more right than any other one. So it goes out and it reads lots of things, and it tries to make the connection between the question and the kinds of things it's read. It looks for different dimensions of evidence. One dimension of evidence <clears throat> is whether or not the candidate answer, one of these things, is actually a liquid. Right? So well, how do we know that? And again, we haven't built databases that tells Watson everything that's a liquid, so it tries to learn that from what it's read. And what it finds is a passage that says cytoplasm is a fluid surrounding the nucleus. So now what Watson has to do to determine if that's good evidence supporting cytoplasm as the answer here, it has to go out and say, well, gee, is fluid a, a liquid? Well, it has lots of algorithms that attempt to do that with lots of different resources. Some of the resources are structured, strict taxonomies, trees of concepts. One of them is WordNet. WordNet tells it that, yes, WordNet is fluid a liquid, it says, as far as I know, because it actually has a correct, a, a formal taxonomy. And in that formal taxonomy, fluid is the more general concept. But what happens is Watson also extracted information from more common language, where fluid and liquid are almost used interchangeably. So it's able to get evidence that, in fact, you can consider fluid a type of liquid, which allows it to boost cytoplasm as a potential answer. 
because one of its dimensions of evidence, which is whether or not it's a liquid, gets supported. Of course, we have other information here that cytoplasm surrounds the nucleus, which could, which could imply that it could also cushion the nucleus. So if I could figure that out, I could boost my evidence that cytoplasm is the right answer once again. Now, why, why, would, why would Watson trust this information that it extracted from a lot of natural language content over the very organized and strict taxonomy from WordNet? And the reason is because Watson trains. So it trains on, on whatever data you give it. So in this case, it's training on Jeopardy questions, questions and answers. So training means, well, as it tries to answer those questions, it's told what the right answers are. So it computes all its scores, and it learns how to balance its scores so that it more often predicts the right answer than the wrong answer. Training on Jeopardy data, it learns that this content that it extracted from reading all, all those that volumes of text is actually reliable for answering Jeopardy questions. If we're strictly trained on physics tests, it would learn that this strict taxonomy is, in fact, in fact more trustworthy than this other information or should be weighed higher. So the information that it trains on helps give it a sense of how to interpret the language and how to, how to answer the questions in that particular context. So I want to talk a little bit more about evidence. There's different kinds of evidence. In May 1898, Portugal celebrated the 400th anniversary of this explorer's arrival in India. So we can look at this strictly from a, a, a token perspective, you know, a bunch of words. And you can imagine that if we went out and did searches with all those keywords, we would get back a passage. In May, Gary arrived in India after he celebrated his anniversary in Portugal. So this is a really good passage. It's got all the keywords in common. And they all line up. And what it suggests is that Gary is the explorer in question. And who's to say Gary's not an explorer, right? I mean, we're all explorers in our own way. Um, I certainly consider myself one. The point is that you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's flexible. It really depends on the context. You know, when a human looks at this, though, and they think, wait a second. Um, you know, while the next sentence might say, Gary returned home to explore his attic looking for a photo album, that would, get, that would be legitimate evidence that Gary is an explorer. But when you look back at the question, you're talking about an entire country celebrating an anniversary for this explorer. This is not probably Gary. This is probably one of the three explorers I remember from my high school studies. Right, so Christopher Columbus, Vasco da Gama, or, you know, I don't know, Magellan. But anyway, so the answer is Vasco da Gama um, here. How do we know that? This evidence, while it's, while it's, you know, it can't be ignored, it's not, it's not terribly precise. It's not revealing much about what's really being understood in the question or the content. So what Watson has to do is learn to discover different kinds of evidence in order to score that evidence higher. In other words, evidence that's more likely to predict the correct answer, it has to learn to score higher. So here's the same question, but we have a different passage. On the 27th of May, 1498, Vasco da Gama landed in Capit Beach. All right, so this question, the only keyword it has in common is May. Why would a computer system even consider it? So the first thing you've got to start imagining is that Watson's got to start to look far and wide. He's got to start to look at a lot more content than it might otherwise. And when it gets that content, it has to do a deeper analysis of it. Because how is it going to know that this, this actually supports the right answer, Vasco da Gama? So it's going to have to start looking at, well, gee, uh, it's going to have to do some temporal reasoning and figure out that a fourth anniversary in 1898 refers to 1498. Through statistical paraphrasing, it's going to learn that landed and arrived in occur in similar enough context to get some signal that they might mean the same thing here, or they might entail one another. So if I landed somewhere, I've arrived there. Um, with geospatial reasoning, by, here's where it would actually use a structured database and know that Capit Beach is in India. So now I could infer that if I landed in Capit Beach, I've arrived in India, and now it suggests that Vasco da Gama is the explorer in question. And now, now the point is, can, can, it, can Watson get more evidence or more support for Vasco da Gama being classified as an explorer than Gary? And, and given the content, likely it can. Vasco da Gama is, is known as an explorer more, more than Gary is. So is it 100% certain? Still not 100% certain. Because it can make mistakes uh, along many of these dimensions. There's both a combination of statistics and heuristics involved in here. So while it can gather evidence, it still has to compute a probability, a likelihood that that, that answer is correct. Shirts, TV remote controls, telephones. Actual Jeopardy question. Anybody? The answer is buttons. I thought, you know, things under my couch. But, um, but Jeopardy thought buttons was the, was the right answer. And what, what's going on here is there's a missing link. There's something that connects these three concepts that you need to find. And one of the things the computer can do is start from those concepts and do spreading activation and find all the things that are related and look at the intersection. 
Sometimes it's obvious that you have to do that. Sometimes it's not. So here's the question. On, the he hearing, on hearing of the discovery of George Mallory's body, he told reporters he still thinks he was first. So there's actually a missing link in here. To answer this properly, you have to go from George Mallory, find all the things George Mallory is related to, find out which one of those things has anything to do with people thinking they're first at something, and it's Mount Everest, and then you can get Edmund Hillary. So there are many possible missing links, missing information, opaque references that help you build and, in, and improve your evidence in finding the right answer to something. So this is another kind of thing that Watson does to resolve the, these, kinds of, uh, these kinds of questions. Um, if you're familiar with Dr. Swanson's work, you know, where he looked for the connection between Raynaud's disease and blood disease, and basically writing a program that looked at lots of text information, found sort of this missing link, which turned out to be fish oil, uh, and then clinical tests were, uh, were, were uh, done after that. But what was interesting was the computer helped generate a hypothesis by looking at lots of textual content and looking for these missing links. So how good is Jeopardy, how good are Jeopardy players at this task? So when we took on the challenge, what were we up against? And this graph helps explain that. So what we see here is um, what we call the winner's clap. So these are actual Jeopardy games. So what I'm plotting is the performance of the winner of those games. Along the x-axis, I'm plotting how many questions did the winning player actually get to answer. So in Jeopardy, everybody has to buzz in. So there are, a question comes up on the board, and there are three players. And, and if you think you know the answer, you have to win the, the, the right, excuse me, the right to uh, uh, answer it first by hitting that buzzer first. So the winning, if you look at the center of the green cloud, the winning player on these games is acquiring nearly 50%, about 47% of the data. So they're more confident, more aggressive, and they're winning that buzz, winning that buzz more often. And the y-axis says how much, how many of those questions are they getting right? So it's their precision. So they're doing between 85 and 95 percent precision on the questions that they buzz in and answer for. So it's really remarkable performance. The red dots are Ken Jennings. Ken Jennings was an all-time uh, uh, Jeopardy champion. He won uh, 74 games in a row. And what you're seeing there is, on average, he acquired 62 percent of a game, which means he was so aggressive and confident and buzzing in, he got a chance to answer, to, to, the first to answer 62 percent, often 70 and up to 81 percent of a game. So we could only speculate that Ken just assumed he knew all things. And unfortunately for his competitors, he was about right at that. He had about 92% precision on those questions. That's how good he was. The brown line is what we call a confidence curve. We took um, a state-of-the-art question and answering system we had been working on for a number of years, uh, a relatively small effort, um, but it was a kind of the classic research effort in, the, in this space. And we had, over the years, partners with some universities and, 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 and other partners. And it really represented a state-of-the-art uh, uh, system for QA. And we applied it to Jeopardy. And the way to read these confidence curves is that where it was most confident, so on the 5%, it really thought it knew the answer in, or more, more so than the other questions, it did about 47% correct. correct. As it had to answer more and more, so as, as it had to answer 50%, it was already down near 15% and plateaued at around, around that level. So this left a huge gap between state-of-the-art performance and really how, you had to, how, how you had to, uh, good you had to be to, uh, to, to play, at, uh, play at Jeopardy. And this is the challenge we took on. How do we advance this technology uh, to get there? So what we ended up with is what we call deep QA. This is the underlying architecture of the Watson system. And the idea is that anal it analyzes the question and the topic, it tries to understand it, it does the grammatical parse, it, it looks for entities, it looks for um, relationships, it tries to understand the question as best as it can. And from there, it generates many, many possible searches and ultimately extracts from those searches, from those searches um, uh, different answers, possible answers, what we call hypotheses. So for example, plasma or vacuole or mitochondria or cytoplasm. So many, many possible answers. And for each one of those answers, it now spawns an independent thread and says, gee, let me assume this answer is right. Can I go collect evidence for that answer from all the different sources I have? And then can I analyze that evidence and get some confidence that the answer is correct? And it does this for all those things. So if I started with one question, and then I ultimately ended up with 100 possible answers, and for each answer I ended up with 100 pieces of evidence, I'd have 10,000 answer evidence pairs. And then for each evidence answer pair, I now have an ensemble of 100 algorithms that score that evidence. They look at that evidence from different dimensions, from a, from a syntactic, from a semantic, from a time perspective, from a location perspective, all kinds of perspectives that 
the different researchers programmed, uh, programmed these algorithms for. So I end up with millions of features, right? Because I have now, I have 10,000 times 100 different scores or features, and now I have to combine them all. So if I have an, uh, uh, an uh, answer, and I have all these features for all these different pieces of evidence, how do I weigh them? What do you mean by features or scores that the algorithms you know, created? How do I weigh them? And that's where the machine learning comes in. And by training the computer, it learns how to balance all those algorithms, how to weigh one more than another in terms of how they contribute to a score. In the end, we, we have a rank list of answers. And for each answer, we have a confidence. We actually map to a, a probability. So if that top answer is above a certain threshold, let's say more than 50% sure it's right, Watson wants to buzz in and answer the question. If it's less than, less than, let's say, 50%, Watson says, you know what, I'm really not sure. And it doesn't want to buzz in. But that threshold can change during the game. If what happens if all of a sudden you're way ahead, you want to take less of a risk. So now you wait to be 95% sure, certain before you buzz in. If, you, if, if you're very aggressive and you're behind and you want to take more of a risk, that threshold gets lowered. So maybe you'll buzz in with only 40% uh, probability. And that's essentially how Watson played Jeopardy. That architecture got populated with hundreds of different algorithms. Um, but along the way, uh, you know, we, 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 it wasn't always this easy. And this is, speaks to, you know, gee, you know, isn't you know, answering questions easy? It's not easy at all. There's lots of subtleties involved in language. And, and in trying to come up with the right answer and having a high confidence that it's correct is actually quite challenging. Here's a, and just to give you a sample of this, here are some growing pains. These are early answers of early versions of Watson. Uh, let's see. Decades before Lincoln, Dan Webster spoke of government made for, made by, and answerable to them. Anybody? The people, that's right. So Watson's answer was uh, no one. So wrong, but you can imagine why this even you know, logically uh, comes, from, uh, comes from that question. Here's another one. Um, an, exclamation, an exclamation point was warranted for the end of this in 1918. That's right. I heard that World War One is the right right answer. But you know, an explanation point always you know it can also end the sentence, and it really doesn't matter what year it ends that sentence. So what you start to see is you know, these things at some it makes sense at some level, but not when you take the full context into consideration. So how do you get smarter and smarter? And this is the kinds of things we would struggle with, um, at, at, you know, as we were developing Watson. In, in 1994, 25 years after this event, one participant said, "For one crowning moment, we were creatures of the cosmic ocean." It's the Apollo, the Apollo landing, um, the Big Bang. Not a lot of people around during the Big Bang, so that was um, to make comments. Um, the English, uh, let's see, the Queen's English. Give a Brit a tinkle when you get in town and you've done this. Call them on the telephone, that's right. But, you know, it's, it's um, Watson's answer. Uh, and uh, finally, and, you know, we have no real justification for this. This is, uh, you know, admittedly a very early version of Watson. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I just like it because I just find it funny. Father of the nicknames. The French, the, this Frenchman was the father of bacteriology. Of course, best or um, actual answer from an early version of Watson. How tasty was my little Frenchman? Um, right. So, um, you know, again, you, know, you, you start to appreciate how there are an enormous amount of subtleties in actually trying to find and score and build enough confidence to actually get the right answer in first position. In Jeopardy, you get no points for any, anywhere else. Um, w you know, we, we devised a whole new uh, methodology for creating, uh, uh, for implementing that architecture and for populating it with various algorithms. We did over 8,000 experiments in a four-year period, each experiment generating over 20 gigabytes of error analysis data that we built tools to actually dig in and try to understand. This is an example of a question with all the alternative answers here and their probabilities. And we would look at all the various algorithms and how they scored those answers to try to understand why was it, you know, which algorithms were contributing to the right answer, which algorithms were contributing to the wrong answer, and how much. This allowed us to dig in and actually understand things and produce something we called evidence profiles. And this is a key idea and something I think is valuable and what I'm going to tie into with medicine, something I think is very valuable in the medical space because ultimately it's not about the answer. We're not expecting Watson to, to finally say, you know, here's the answer and I'm done. What we're, still, we're expecting Watson to do is to be a tool that gives people access to evidence, whatever out there that happens to support a particular answer. 
whether it be an element of a differential diagnosis or a possible treatment, what out there in all that content actually supports it, and to what degree does the system feel that that support is warranted? In other words, what, what weight is it assigning that support? So here we have a question, Chile shares its longest land border with this country. And you look at it and you say, well, gee, you know, don't you have a database where you look up borders and countries and compute lenses? Well, we don't know we were going to get a question like that. So you know, this is largely answered by trying to read natural language content and build evidence based on what it's read. And we have all those algorithms. Some of them look at location. Some of them look at passages. And there are many, many different algorithms that look at how passages align with one another, both syntactically and semantically. We look at popularity. Um, we look at source reliability. Uh, we look at classification. We actually look at a bunch of other uh, uh, different classes of features. I'm just showing you a few here. And we see that Argentina, which is the right answer, um, gets more weight from the location uh, algorithms, from the passion support, not from the popularity. It turns out there's a lot of content in there talking about, oh, Bolivia is in a land dis uh, border dispute with Chile, and this is basically noise. But it's, it's coming from the popularity score, and these other scores have more weight. Source reliability turns out that the, inf the information where some of that content is coming from uh, for um, Bolivia is actually not as reliable than the, than the stuff coming for in for Argentina. And then finally, classification. Watson thought they were both countries, which is a good thing. Um, so what happens here, Argentina, uh, Argentina I'm sorry, where it wins out. Uh, and it's got the, the, the right evidence, even though the popularity metric preferred, uh, preferred Bolivia. Here we have Dill Fine Bethel College and Seminary in this holy Minnesota city. Different question, turns out, unfortunately, for the computer that there is a Bethel College and seminary in both South, South, St. Paul, Minnesota, and South Bend, Indiana. So these become confusers for the computer. But, and, and, and in fact, the computer knows that it likes St. Paul better because it's in the right place. It actually has negative evidence for South Bend. But what the computer is not doing is realizing that, that when you're comparing these two answers, if one of them is in Minnesota, that should outweigh just about any other piece of evidence. So this helps us understand how to adjust our models and how to adjust our algorithms to understand these features. Unfortunately, for all the other features, uh, South Bend, Indiana ended up scoring higher, but that critical location one um, lost out to. So unfortunately, we answered with South Bend, but, uh, with St. Paul. But, um, but this helped us improve the system uh, by understanding better the importance and significance of location information for certain classes of questions. That without this error analysis, we would not have been able to anticipate, right? So we're going through this, this iterative process. Here we also see that humans answer this by looking at holy. And they think, oh, wait, you know, holy's in quotes. Is this pun going on? And of course, that helps them prefer St. Paul. Well, our architecture allowed someone to independently create a pun detector, something that looked for pun-like relationship between words. We were able to plug that in, retrain, and St. Paul actually gained more weight uh, uh, given that pun uh, score and outweighed, of course, say, South Bend. But what bubbled up to the top was Holy Cross, Minnesota, because after all, Holy Cross is more um, holy than South Bend. Um, but the point here is that when we do this error analysis, we could try to understand the classes of evidence that are missing, and you could build independent algorithms that go after that, that different class of evidence and very quickly integrate that into the system. So with that architecture and with that technique, we drove this performance um, from, you know, from what was state-of-the-art back at that time all the way to uh, actually Watson's performance is actually a little bit higher than that right now to that top confidence curve. And what's that? That's slicing right through the winner's cloud so it says that Watson can be competitive with champion players. Would it win every game? Not necessarily, but it can be very competitive. And even 70% 70, 70 of all the questions is doing upwards of 87% uh, precision. So now, the question, so now the issue, of course, is how quickly can it do that? And on a single 2.6 gigahertz CPU, Watson was taking two hours to gather and scroll all that evidence and answer the question. And the Jeopardy producers kept explaining that that would be a very boring Jeopardy game. Um, and so what we had to do was you know, obviously make it faster to compete. And we took that computation and we scaled it out in over 2,880 cores. So in other words, that same computation uh, because of that technique we use, th th that architecture, deep QA architecture, is what we call embarrassingly parallel. In other words, you, sp you keep splitting, and every time you split, you can go off in an independent path and run that on independent CPUs. And this is what we did. So we were able to very, very quickly scale this out on 2,880 cores and got the time it took to answer a question from two hours down to just a few seconds. And that's what ultimately competed on Jeopardy. So using deep analytics and speed, um, on, the, on the Jeopardy game, we actually showed what we call the answer panel, 
which showed just the top three answers and the confidence that it had in those answers. And we also showed that white bar, which shows where the threshold was. So in other words, you're, it, it wouldn't answer, it wouldn't even try to answer, attempt to answer, unless its confidence was above that threshold. But of course, what you didn't, did not see on the Jeopardy game is you, you did not see that evidence profile. Right? You didn't dig into those answers, you dig into those answers and ask, why did you like this answer? What was your evidence and why was it supported? Which in real applications is exactly what you would reveal. Because the evidence, you know, helping the human make a decision is about exposing them quickly and accurately to meaningful evidence. It's not about coming up with the answer alone. Um, and it, we actually did play more than that one game that was on television, or those two games that are on television. We played 55 games against tournament and champion players and won over 71%. But of course, Jeopardy has a lot of luck elements with the betting and the other, other factors. Um, and our real, of course, direction is taking this out of the game of Jeopardy and into various application areas, um, from healthcare to tech support, enterprise knowledge management to government. One of the areas that sort of we're, we're most excited about and have started to put uh, a lot of our effort is in the healthcare space. And I wanted to give you a sense of uh, wh why we think this is a powerful idea for healthcare. You know, I, I talked about these evidence profiles and these various dimensions of evidence, but you can imagine that, you know, as you build applications in the space and you build analytics, those dimensions of evidence take on sort of a, a application-specific flavor. Uh, for example, in medicine, they might become symptoms, family history, personal history, medications findings, maybe a whole range of different classes of evidence that you might be looking for uh, to support a particular differential diagnosis. And then through training, of course, we can combine and come up and rank with final confidences. But it's really looking at these scores and drilling into the evidence that's of, of, of most interest. So given symptoms and uh, various kinds of history, the notes and the volumes of textbooks, journals, and references, you could imagine helping to, um, to suggest uh, uh, differential diagnosis and building evidence profiles for, for, for each for each element in that diagnosis, making that access, uh, uh, providing access to that so that you actually could look at these things and drill in and, and, uh, and um, help, help, help you make decisions, help you dig in and find out what, what's in support of this stuff. I kind of want to jump to some of the challenges, of course. Like Jeopardy, medicine has very many different forms of evidence. You have um, uh, passage evidence, you have uh, document-oriented evidence, you have structured sources, whether it be taxonomies and databases. You have semi-structured sources like lists. There's enormous amount of information there in lots of different forms. This is exactly the kind of challenge that we face with, uh, face in trying to do Jeopardy. You have to read this stuff, tie it together, understand the context in which different assertions uh, may, be, may be true or may be false. You have different ways to express things. Uh, we have uh, difficulty swallowing, food gets held up, can cause food to move, move slowly in the esophagus. There are very different ways to express both uh, pain and symptoms. How do you connect those? And you, you know, can you use a lot of the same techniques to gather and, real, and connect these various kinds of dots even when they're not cooperating? And what I mean by that is they're not expressed the same way all the time in some formal language. Um, so what we started to do was to adapt uh, this architecture start to answer medical questions. And, um, you know, so it's this, we, we took the exact same system. In fact, we took nothing out uh, except the Bible and Shakespeare out of the content. But we left in all the algorithms and all the other sources of information. But we started to put in, um, we mined symptoms from natural language, so we had things that would detect uh, medical symptoms. Um, we put in UMLS. Uh, for type recognition. We tailored some of the question type identification stuff for medical questions. We, we made a couple, uh, several different um, adjustments to the content and to the algorithms. But instead of now four years of work, we're talking about four months of work, um, and we took a baseline, so we took the Jeopardy system and we applied it to a bunch of different uh, 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 questions that were created to test residents. And um, there's some examples up here. And we did baseline on the Jeopardy system. And then we spent about three to four person months. And we actually drove the performance way up. Um, so this is very significant. Uh, because what this means is that architecture and that approach and all the algorithms we developed um, can be quickly adapted, or at least in this case, was quickly adapted to a whole different body of content, one focused on the, on, on the medical space. So we're continuing to, to adapt this to work on medical content, but at the same time, we're thinking about how this might um, be used and how it might interact uh, with healthcare professionals. So this is a vision of a user interface. 
Um, that uh, here we have a list of various uh, patients. This is not the exciting part. Um, so we have cases, we have case overview, we have notifications. Uh, but this is the more interesting part. So from the, um, from the electronic medical record and or other sources, uh, the idea is that Watson actually tried to pull out uh, the symptom information, the family history, the allergies, the demographics. This information can be acquired from an EMR or it can actually be acquired through um, interaction with uh, with the doctor or with another healthcare professional, and we imagine sort of this multimodal interface where it's a, you know imagine using this on like a, a tablet uh, where you've already extracted stuff from an EMR uh, EMR database, but you're also interacting with it either through multi-touch, possibly even some voice recognition, uh, to gather and and identify this. We have some tags on some of this stuff, like this is a chief part of the chief complaint, or this is new information that you haven't seen the last time you went to the portal here. And then we have a couple of tabs, uh, diagnosis, treatment, or ask Watson directly. And based on the information, it's giving you that answer panel. So it's saying, you know, here are the uh, top set of things, and here are my confidences. But it could go in, uh, we call that the answer list. Um, but we can go in and we could look at where did the, uh, the information come from. And we, act, we act, actually see uh, the raw data that Watson extracted, red eye from, pain from, blurred vision from. So all those things that were on the, on, the, uh, on the left panel, you can go in there and look at the original sources where that information was extracted by Watson. And then you can, then you can take this, uh, this answer panel, you can select three, of the, let's say three of the top answers. So I'm selecting those, you know, the purple, and I get to give me the comparative evidence profile. So now you're looking at the evidence profile. So this is the same concept I was showing you earlier, and it's picking uvitis and aritis and keratitis and it's saying, you know, I have um, symptom information prefers uh, uvitis, family history prefers aritis. I, I'm probably pronouncing these things incorrectly. Um, and we have some weighted ev evidence from demographics. And then we can actually click on the, on the symptoms section and say, where did that evidence come from? So w w what did you read that is, that is giving, you, giving you that evidence profile? Uh, and you can also, um, you could also give feedback and say whether or not you think this is good or bad evidence. So this helps Watson train to understand better, gee, you know, I, I, I thought this was good evidence in support of that, in support of that diagnosis. Did the doctor think that was good or not? And what Watson will do under the hood is actually something very interesting. It'll, it'll actually be able to compare the, uh, this uh, to, to the, the, the case data and figure out where it failed. So I'll look for the parts that align very well and the parts that did not align very well, and it'll actually generate questions to help it learn where it might have failed so it can get smarter over time. Um, we can look at the, the, the factors, the present factors that are, in, that are in the case and in the evidence, the information that's in the case but not in the evidence, so we could basically sort this stuff uh, to quickly understand um, you know, what's in there and what, what, what factors in there and what factors aren't. Um, and, and for any one of those, again, you could dig into the original, in the, the original evidence. Something similar for treatment. Um, here, you, you, once, the, um, once it was assumed, and this is what we call the scratch pad, so once something was assumed, like let's say the patient has Lyme disease, um, you ask for treatments and comes up with some uh, antibiotics. Um, here, we actually have it, that this could come up from a number of different places. It could just be added, the patient's pregnant, or um, you can actually, uh, imagine that Watson's analyzing the evidence and you basically just ask it, what's the difference between these various things? And one of, them's, you know, one of them says, well, you know, the difference between one treatment and the other depends on these five things. One of them is whether or not the patient's pregnant or not. Uh, so you can say, well, let's assume the patient is pregnant and then you get, and, and you get a completely different list here. These are actual answers, by the way. So the, the, this, um, this interface is something we're experimenting with and exploring as, uh, from a user interface concept. The actual um, answers and confidences and evidences are wasn't actually produced for this content. So that that uh, came from the came from the real system. So that that's um that's kind of you know I want to stop there and just op open it up for 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 challenges. Exactly. That's exactly exactly what I was alluded to. Yep. So you, we analyze the evidence itself and we say. Exactly. This is, what differ this is what differentiates between these two answers. Um, so you're looking at analyzing the evidence itself and actually, and, and can ask the follow-up questions and say, you know, you know what? Um, I have something that's all the way on, on, you know, on the 20th on my list, but it's, ve it's a very severe problem. And if you can answer this one question, because Watson could do the look ahead, 
you know, if this piece of evidence were true, and I don't know if it's true, but if it were true, for example, if the patient visited Connecticut in the last six months, then this would rise to the top. So it could do that look ahead and then ask, so did the patient visit Connecticut? Because that would change things. So, um, yeah, so chronology is very important, and, and we fully expect that all the information it, that, it, that it considers is going to be, have, have to be with respect to time. We haven't done that, but we know that that's exactly what needs to be done, and a lot of our temporal scorers will look at um, the significance with respect to when things occurred. Correct. Yeah, so, one, so again, another, we've just started to apply it to medicine, but very much on the radar screen is using all existing structured resources um, that can predict these kinds of relationships to use them as a source of evidence. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so visual evidence is really important. You know, this is, um, it, you, so this is built on uh, an infrastructure for analytics called UIMA, UIMA, the Unstructured Information Management Architecture, which is actually something we created at IBM and we contributed to open source. It's now an Apache open source project. And what UIMA uh, allows you to do is integrate different um, modalities. So in other words, text, image, speech, and video analytics all in one environment. And it's fully expected that ultimately you want to tie image analysis with text analysis in one system. Now, some of the image analysis techniques, of course, are very, very powerful diagnostic tools. Um, and to the extent that you bring in, I mean, Watson itself doesn't do image analysis, but you would bring in those image analysis um, algorithms and have this contribute as another source of evidence, uh, along with whatever you can gather from the textual content to contribute to that ranking, basically. Yes? Yeah. So the, so the core, that's a great, yeah. So, so great question. So the, the, um, the content really stabilized fairly early on. What we continued to do experiments where we would try to bring more content in, and we, we, we had a methodology to decide whether or not that, con that content alone would help. So algorithms and content evolution, uh, content um, acquisition and integration, if you will, evolved uh, simultaneously, sort of in parallel. Um, however, uh, what, what we found in that case was content stabilized fairly rapidly in terms of you know, getting the right stuff that had answers in it. And really to get from like, uh, I could bring, that, bring back that chart uh, real quick. Um, lots of clicks, huh? I did all those clicks to get there, there we go. Um, so you know, so around, around here, uh, sort of the near, near to the bottom of the cloud, uh, the content had stabilized. Uh, so you would add more content, it wouldn't really make that much difference. Uh, so it was really all about uh, the algorithms. And we had techniques for building content because we weren't unlimited in the amount of content you could look at. You know, the Watson system um, had to be self-contained. So which meant that we weren't, we weren't accessing millions of servers on the internet or petabytes of information. Uh, so ultimately, the thing had to be optimized to deliver with certain limits. And um, so if you brought more content in, first of all, you had to tolerate the noise that that content did, which it turns out this system was very good at tolerating noise, because very often it would be rare for us to bring in a body of content and for our score to go down. But it would be common for us to, to bring in content for nothing to happen. But that would be costly to even have that in the indices. 
in terms of how big your system is. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't include it if it, it couldn't add any value. But these things evolve, um, they evolve uh, you know, together in, in cooperation because part of the reason why content might not have value is because your algorithms aren't smart enough to get the value out of them. So very often to, to do justice, you'd have to do error analysis and saying, why am I failing? Why am I failing with this content? So we separated the idea of recall from precision. So recall said the answer is there somewhere. You know, so you know, we get it in somewhere in the top 1,000, but now let's look at the evidence. Why aren't our algorithms uh, realizing that that answer is properly supported in that content? And then do we need to develop our algorithms to make our algorithms smarter over that content? And that would sort of go, um, would evolve in parallel. Well, so I'm not really sure what you mean by not known. So, um, in other, so not no, like for example, the Jeopardy answers to the Jeopardy question were not known to the computer, um, but the we're not in other. <laughs> so it's like. Um, no, they're not. They're not. They're not known. So like the met, they're not known by the people developing the algorithms either. The answers are not known. We, we don't even get to see the questions. So in fact, they're all blind. Oh, we would only test on blind data. All the, that, all those tests is blind. blind. Yeah. Right. So if there's no answer, so that's different. If there's no answer, so if you have to think about what what is the system really doing, the system is not. Uh, the system is is it's providing you. A list of let's say let's for the sake of argument say they're diseases. It's providing you a list of diseases that the content you gave it supports. That's what it's doing. So if there's no support, you know, given what's given what the information you provided from the patient case, and given all the information you've exposed it to, from reference books to you know to journals to whatever. It's going out there, and its job is to say, is, you know, what diseases are supported by that evidence? And if it's not out there, it's not going to come up with it. Give, exactly, exactly. It, it's basically to help, it's to do the, cert, the, sort of the, the search and analysis work over all that content for you. Right? And if it's not out there, it's not out there. So this is ultimately evidence from what does all this stuff say? Ulti ultimately, the, you know, the professional has to decide what to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent, right, excellent. So that's, so that's great. So, so um, you're exactly right. And in, in fact, if, you know, I, I, you know I, was, I, was, I was saying earlier um, offline that um, you know, I started it, I was, was pre-med. I got a biology undergraduate and I was pre-med. And, and I got sort of excited about computers and the potential. And I was thinking about medical expert systems when I was in high school and I did one when I was in college and then again in graduate school. And they were horrible failures, and not, not because my, I was a bad programmer, but because the acquisition to knowledge was, it was impossible to axiomatize the entire world and to maintain that axiomatization, which is what expert systems at the time required. 
And what I mean by axiomatization, right, is you have these formal if this, then this, if this, then this, then this, under these conditions, and very, very, very difficult, time-consuming, and ultimately brittle um, uh, to do. What's exciting me about this is that this is doing that kind of reasoning, generating hypotheses, and then trying to gather and score evidence for those hypotheses over unstructured content. This is the content that you guys already know how to produce. You don't have to put this into a formal mathematics. So this is extremely exciting because it's hitting exactly that weakness that was in expert systems. Even though expert systems can do this complex deductive proof, it required all this axiomatic formalized knowledge to do. This doesn't. The, the other thing you're, you're saying is how do I acquire knowledge? Well, there's also promise there too because now what I want to be able to do is I want to show you that natural language passage that, that I, I being the computer, I want to show you that natural language passage I read um, you, you've told me what the right answer is, and you, you've given me the patient's case of the question, and I want to show you where I failed. And where I failed is going to generate a question. So an example, remember the, the cytoplasm example I gave, up, gave where it says, you know, um, uh, cytoplasm uh, is a fluid that surrounds the nucleus? And now I find out cytoplasm is the answer, but I gave that passage very low confidence that it supported the answer cytoplasm. And it turns out cytoplasm is right. So here's the question I have for you, and Watson can generate this question. If I surround something, do I necessarily cushion it? You can understand that question. And, and then I could further qualify for you, and I could say, does it happen when it's uh, liquid? If the, thing, if the thing doing the cushioning is a liquid, if it's soft, I could give you some properties. You, I am now acquiring, of course, you all know it's not true. It depends on the elasticity of the membrane that surrounds the system. but. Okay. But the point is that I can start generating, automatically generating questions in the terms of the language that you express the question in and the content is in. And, and this, is, you know, this is this whole what they call active learning area, and I generate that when I fail. So when the computer fails to judge the evidence high enough, I can generate reasonable questions and start to capture the information. I'm very excited about that. So uh, let me see if I understand. Is, is um, you're thinking in the application of this, will will it influence um, the diagnostic process, for example? Oh. Well, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's my viewpoint, and I don't know if this is right um, ultimately, but it's my viewpoint. It's certainly not always true. So I don't know what value what I'm about to say is going to have. Certainly not always true, um, but it's my, start, it's my starting position. My starting position is I don't want to change the way you work. I don't want to change the way you do research. I don't want to get you to formalize information that you're not comfortable formalizing. Because I think if I do that, I'm actually going to lose information. Um, because the way, you, the, way you, the way you do research and the way you express your findings, you've been doing that for decades, and you're finding it very useful. And, it's, you know, and I'm going to assume that for the most part, you know, that's optimal. I'd rather not come in and change the way you do things. Um, so I'd rather adapt the computer to exploit what you're doing. Um, and, and, but that's not, it's not always true, because there may be situations where however you're doing it can be improved and should be improved. But, I, but, but generally, I don't want to have the computer algorithm require you to do something. I, I think that's kind of where we are today, frankly, with EMRs. That's where we are today with databases, where we come in and say, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to change the way you do everything because the computer's limited. I'd rather go the other way around, if possible. <laughs> Great. Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't. 
<laughs> Thank you. Well, we, we would interface. We would interface with an EMR. We would help get extract data from 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 the EMR databases. Was there a response then? Of, you know, developing a similar product, or are they trying to develop a? I, I to be honest, I don't know. Um, I, I I I know that you know the. For Watson to acquire the information that it would use as you know evidence, the reason and stuff, it would have to extract stuff from an EMR. But I can't, I can't answer more specifically than that. I don't know. Yeah. Mhm. Mm yeah. You guys need to upgrade. <laughs> That's a great question. It was very easy. We eliminated all of them. Everything's in main memory for this application. <laughs> uh, 15 terabytes. But, um, you know, so one of the things I want to, you got to take all this with a grain of salt because the, um, in the following way, the Jeopardy system was very, very highly constrained uh, to play Jeopardy. And so I think the, the best thing you could do with, with the 2,800 cores and the 15 terabytes of RAM is say, wow, the human brain's amazing. Because you know, this is what they had to do to compete at Jeopardy, where the human brain fits in a shoebox and is powered by a tuna fish sandwich and a glass of water, right? And he got 80 kilowatts. Um, you know, so, um, and about 10 refrigerators worth of hardware. But I mean, I think the reality is when you go into any given application, you're going to turn the knobs on this very thing very differently. You know, we call it you know workload, you know, optimizing for a particular workload, or workload optimized systems, and you're going to sit there and you're going to say, well, you know, what kind of response time do you need, and is there an interactive you know interface here which eats up lots of cycles and gives you more time to compute? Are there multiple questions being answered at once? So now you get higher utilization of your CPU. You know, in the, in, the, in this thing. You know, the, the computation goes through all these cores in like a wave, right? So it's going through and it's, and it's using sort of, because each bank sort of a processor are doing something a little bit different as it's going through. So now all these CPUs over here are idle as the questions moving in, start answering another question. But in Jeopardy, it's one question at a time, right? So there's so, these all, there's, there's so many knobs to turn to figure out um, what it will really cost to deliver an application. And we're learning how to do that now. So I, I wouldn't use this as really a measuring stick here. Um, you know, so be careful. Linux. All right, thank you. Oh well, 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 well. We we were um, so there was, it was taped in January. Right?